Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us. I could not be more excited to welcome you to this workshop hosted by the Chemical Sciences Roundtable on diversity, equity, and inclusion in chemistry and chemical engineering. My name is Jeremy Mathis, and I'm the director of the board on chemical sciences and technology here at the Academy. And this two-day workshop will be the first of many activities over the next few years led by the board on chemical sciences and technology on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the chemical sciences. Specifically, this event will aim to increase awareness of potential barriers to DEI and help participants gain the information needed to create more diverse, equitable, and inclusive environments in their workplaces. The workshop is divided into three sessions. The first will focus on establishing programs that aim to build a climate conducive to DEI or enhance DEI in the talent pool. The second session will take place over Slack and will consist of productive conversations among all of the participants. And finally, the third session will focus on emerging programs that aim to increase DEI in the chemical sciences. Please feel free to engage in productive conversations on Slack during sessions one and three, and there are dedicated Slack channels for those conversations. To submit questions throughout the workshop, please use the Q&A feature on Zoom. If you are tuning in via the live stream, you can submit questions to the speakers by emailing Ben Ulrich at the address that you see there. And please note that this event is being broadcast and recorded and that by participating, you agree to have your questions and thoughts relayed into perpetuity. Additionally, there will be a proceedings and brief published later this year that summarizes the events of the workshop. And therefore, by submitting questions and engaging in the conversations on Zoom and Slack, you agree to have those conversations published. There are several resources on our website for your reference and use throughout the workshop, including the agenda, the speakers and the planning committee bios and a Slack guidance document. And if you're a Slack novice like me, please make sure uh, you check that document out uh, early and often because we do want everybody to be able to participate in the breakout discussions. Please take a moment to read through before participating in the Slack channel uh, to make sure that you understand how to use all the functions. If you have any questions or experiencing technical issues, please refer to that Slack guidance document first and then feel free to reach out to one of our support staff like Ben Ulrich. I would like to extend my sincerest thanks to our planning committee members, Carlos Gonzalez, Ian Henry, Rigoberto Hernandez, Malika jeffries L, Mary Kirchhoff, Cheryl Legan, and Leita Winfield. They took a very simple idea that we came up with a few months ago and have turned it into this tremendous event that you're going to see over the next two days. I also wanna thank our sponsors, the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. We could not do any of this without their commitment and their support that they have so steadfastly uh, over the past few years. And finally, I definitely wanna thank our National Academy staff and the team that has put this together led by Jessica Wolfman. They have done a fantastic job of bringing together uh, the sessions in this workshop and really turning uh, this idea into something that I think is going to be very special uh, as we look at launching our big DEI initiative that we'll have with the Board on Chemical Sciences and Technology and the Chemical Sciences Roundtable over the next few years. And now I have the great pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Freeman Hrabowski uh, is the president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. His research and publications focus on science and mathematics education with special emphasis on minority participation and performance. Previously, he chaired a National Academies Committee that produced a 2011 report, Expanding Underrepresented Minority Participation, America's Science and Technology Talent at a Crossroad. Moderating the discussion following his talk will be uh, Rigoberto Hernandez, who is the Gaunt Family Professor in the Department of Chemistry at Johns Hopkins University and the Director of the Open Chemistry Collaborative in Diversity, Equity, or Oxide. So with that, I'll turn it over to Freeman uh, to get us started. And I wanna thank you all again for joining us for this event today. 
Great, Jeremy. Thank you very much. I, I plan to talk in a conversational manner for about 20 minutes and then to open it up for questions and Rigoberto will be uh, answer, asking me questions based on what you say. And I, I begin with the report that Jeremy just mentioned at the Crossroads report, because as it turns out, that report was written 10 years ago. I, I chaired that committee. Uh, my colleague, Peter Henderson, was the head of the, of the of study itself. And we had a number of recommendations that I think are as important today uh, as they were 10 years ago. We talked about this pipeline, the the continuum from K through 12 or pre-K through 12 through undergrad education, graduate education, PhD programs, postdocs, and then careers in the professoriate and then other research careers. And what is significant is that we found uh, surprisingly that there were so many students who were interested in, in science and engineering. And the report, by the way, focuses heavily on the natural sciences and engineering. Certainly there are concerns about the social sciences, but we specifically focused on the areas where we have, the, have had the least amount of progress, and that is in the natural sciences and engineering. And in those areas, what we found was a great interest on the part of many people in students in getting into those areas. And yet that the majority of students uh, who go into those areas, majoring in those areas in the undergraduate experience, end up not succeeding. Now, wh why is that important? Well, it, it didn't surprise us that only about 20% of underrepresented groups, particularly African Americans, Latinx, Hispanics, um, Native Americans, that in those populations, only 20% were graduating. This is what we hear all the time. We were surprised to find that only about 32% of whites and about 41% of Asian Americans were succeeding, defining success simply as completing a bachelor's degree in those areas. And so what we can say, and it, it is still the case, that two thirds of Americans across the racial groups who begin in science and engineering don't succeed. Now, the first response from many people is, it's a K through 12 problem. And as I often say, we in colleges blame high schools who blame the elementary schools uh, who will then blame the family somehow, and the husband says it's the wife's problem. And so I'm always suggesting that we, we spend a lot of time finger pointing on one other group or some group below us. But what was interesting is that once we looked at the data, what we saw was that large numbers of students who were well prepared by all the definitions, AP um, courses uh, in high school, uh, high SAT scores, uh, that even those students tended not to stay in science that often the more prestigious the university, academically prestigious, socially prestigious, the greater the likelihood that student, that student will leave science. And at first people were suggesting it was because, well, they can go and make more money. Well, when we looked at it, no, often those students who were A students from high schools um, ended up getting C's and deciding to go into another area. And so what was clear was that it was the case, and it still is the case, that we tend to think of that first year or two in science and engineering as weed out courses. And so our major recommendation was that we strengthen the undergraduate experience. And while there have been some experiments in places, um, the challenge is that we're still not seeing larger numbers of people of color, um, as well as others who are succeeding there. In fact, uh, my colleague Peter Henderson and I are writing another uh, piece right now based on from the 2011 to now using the research that we've done that's been published in the issues of science and technology, two articles that you will see there, uh, and a piece that we wrote for the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the last year uh, based on the, the conference celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Beneva Bush report. And what we are seeing is that we are, we've collected the new data from the National Science Foundation. And when looking at Blacks, for example, we've gone from 2.2% of African-Americans who had, were uh, earning PhDs among all the PhDs awarded in the country uh, in, in a given year for American institutions to now from 2.2% to today, 2.3%. And so my talk today is really on moving the needle, but there's one caveat. It's important to recognize any progress that's being made. And there is progress being made, even though we know we need much more, but it's the progress that can give us hope. And so uh, from our own campus, you will see this, that we've become the number one producer of African-Americans who go on to complete 
not only MD PhDs, but now also PhDs in natural sciences and engineering. And, um, and, and as, as great as that might sound, what that means is we're producing about 15 a year who've actually gone on bachelor's recipients, who've gone on and complete PhD per year. And um, when you look at the top 10, and we've just gotten this new data for Blacks, and then I'm gonna say something about the Latinx, the Hispanic population. The fact is that, and this will be in the new article that will come out in Issues in Science Te and Technology later this year, that um, many of them are the HBCUs. We are not an HBCU. We have students from 100 countries. We talk about international and domestic diversity, and we have perhaps about 19% African-American, about eight or nine percent Hispanic, and the largest minority group for us would be Asian, about twenty-five percent. But the, the fact is that that list looks like this: UMBC, um, North Carolina a t has become number two in the country. Howard is number three. Then Florida a and Spelman are tied for number four. Xavier, and then the University of Maryland College Park, University of Florida, and uh, Morgan and Jackson State, Morehouse and Hampton. That gets you through the top twelve or so. Now to be in that top twelve. For example, we're talking about producing between seven PH bachelors who complete PhDs and 15. The numbers are very small for all of us. And for the Latino population, the numbers are on a different scale, but the two University uh, of Puerto Rico campuses are especially significant. Between those two, Mayaguez and Piedras, we're talking about almost 900 over a 10 year period. So you're talking about about 90 per year from those two if you look at the next campuses, you're talking about um, University of Texas El Paso is first, and then University of Florida, and then several other University of California campuses. But if you take the next three or four campuses be beyond the Puerto Rican campuses and add those numbers together, they still wouldn't be as many as the 90 per year of Puerto Ricans that the, those two Puerto Rican universities are creating. And that's a challenge given the financial challenges in that country right now, something that needs a lot of attention. But here's my point that the question is, how are those institutions doing it? What are they doing? And what did we say in our report 10 years ago? It is that we need to think about ways of uh, replicating those initiatives. Uh, many of you have heard me talk before and others talk about the Mile Hub program and, and, there, and, and my TED talk, which focuses on that and the four college pillars of success. And what I would suggest is what we talk about in science in general would be what we'd be talking about in chemistry and chemical engineering uh, also, because you're talking about the preparation of students, their performance, the idea that they have such a good experience that they want to do research, that you want to get into the field, whether they're going on to do research or not. Why do we focus on the PhDs? We need more people in the professoriate. We know that. In most universities, there are very few people of color, uh, one or two Blacks, one or two Hispanics, if that. In many, there are none. And students of color need to see them, but students in general need to see people of all types able to do this work and succeeding in this work. The other part, though, is that th those four pillars of college success from my TED talk, it's the expectations. It is the idea of building community among the students and the faculty. It is the important notion that it takes researchers to produce right. researchers, just as artists pull other artists into the work. It takes researchers to produce researchers. And then we have to go turn to more rigorous evaluation of the work that we're doing. Um, the, the, the newest book that my colleagues and I have written is entitled The Empowered University. And the notion is empowered Universities must be empowered to look in the mirror itself and to be honest about what is working and what is not working. And I would say that about the scientific community. I would say that about us people in chemistry, chemical engineering and other areas. My background is mathematics and certainly it's true in my discipline. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying high expectations, but not just high expectations of our students. Of course, we know that. But the question is about high expectations of, uh, of our colleagues and of ourselves. Are we doing all that we need to do? If you get a chance, look at our chemistry discovery center. Uh, the chair of chemistry at the time, Bill, of course, who's now dean of science, worked with faculty to create a program that would involve much more collaboration, much more use of technology, real time uh, responses to people, much more group work. And uh, the results were phenomenal. We increased substantially the number of students of all types, including students of color who were able to go on and to complete degrees. Um, in fact, uh, some years ago, uh, the, the statistic that was most stunning in the country at the, about 2000, after we'd been working on Mile Hall 
and we'd begun to do things with this chemistry discovery center years, a few years after that, what we saw was that there had been 66 blacks in the country who had uh, completed bachelors in biochemistry. 22 came from my campus, one third. And we've never had that better number again since then. But people did begin to look at what we were doing. And, and the key had to do with looking at the backgrounds of students, figuring out what's the minimum level of skill students would need to have a reasonable chance in four or five years of completing a degree and doing well with at least these and getting into the research, uh, getting faculty much more involved in the work. And that's one of the questions in the Empowered University. Uh, to what extent are senior faculty involved in the work? Who are the champions? The champion for us has for years been Mike Summers, member of the National Academy, he's a Howard Hughes investigator, and he has shown others uh, what that means, so much so that he leads our replication effort right now. And that goes to one of the recommendations in our report from 11 years ago, find the best programs and replicate them. It's not just about replicating practices, that is important, but finding a program that really works. And we go to the mile hop. So at this point, Howard Hughes has funded replication efforts at both Penn State and, and Chapel Hill. And we've published the results in science and the results are remarkable. Those campuses are doing better and better in those areas. Uh, we are now replicating the mile hop program out at Chen at, with funding from Chad Zuckerberg at both Berkeley and San Diego. And the key in every case is uh, that's most critical, collaboration among faculty members on different campuses about the best approach to uh, developing the program and to looking at what works, understanding there's always some ad adaptation given the culture of an institution. And so whether we're talking about the programs from that NIH has funded or the programs that NSF has funded from the INCLUSE program to the most recent, the BUILD program at NIH, what we need to be doing is looking at the evaluation to determine the extent to which it's working. We have used the URISE program from, uh, from the um, NIH in working with our Myhoffs and others to increase those numbers. And we can do the same thing with these other programs. But, but the most important recommendation we made at the federal level is that there needs to be much more coordinated work done among the national agencies. Right now, we have different grants going out to different campuses. There is no true coordination of that work so that we understand who's making the difference. And, and there would be several things I would say. Number one, we need to think about identifying those best programs and those campuses. Um, those Puerto Rican campuses are doing an amazing job. The University of Texas, El Paso for, the, for the Hispanic students doing a fine job. And there are some others who have made a lot of progress. Our University of Florida is impressive for both blacks and Hispanics, which is very unusual. Uh, and so the idea that that we have one kind of institution that can do it all cannot work. We must look at minority serving institutions. We are one of those. We must look at the HBCUs. We look at, of course, Hispanic serving institutions and then research universities and, and challenge institutions from the president, provost, dean, senior faculty in any area uh, to, talk, to talk about what would it take to even get on the list of institutions producing the top 30. In fact, one of the recent articles we wrote in Issues in Science and Technology said that if we can, if we could double the number of students in the top 30 for, uh, bachelor's producing institutions for Blacks and similarly for Hispanics, that if we could double that number. For Blacks, we would increase the number by something like 40% and for Hispanics about 25% in the country. In other words, just doing that, just focusing laser focus on the most successful institutions they have been producing many more can make a big difference. Um, and, and similarly, to invite other institutions into that work. Uh, 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 Rigoberto, I'm very pleased with the work of Hopkins uh, and the fact that you've gotten a large grant there at this point at the graduate level for the Vivian Thomas program. Very proud of that. Very proud to be one of the campuses who will be working with you along with Howard and Morehouse and Spellman. And, and several others. Uh, and the key to and Morgan uh, and I believe a &T, the a the key here is that we need more public-private partnerships that can focus on um, private funds to help and public funds. I, I, and I'm very proud of Hopkins and the Vivian Thomas program that they're developing, but we need money at that level for the undergrad also, um, um, because we need to build those numbers. And then finally, and before I get into questions, if you think about replicating, if you think about doubling the numbers, if you think about honest, difficult conversations on campuses, 
I have no doubt we can increase those numbers. And even though it sounds so discouraging to hear from 2% to 2.3%, but we have been producing more PhDs. And, and, and I had several examples of what one person can do. So the first black woman to become a full professor in chemical engineering at Michigan um, um, is one of our graduates and she is amazing. Um, Lola is uh, now associate dean, but she's pulling in more students. And similarly at Duke, uh, another chemical engineering graduate from UMBC who went on uh, to Duke, did an MD PhD, first black to get a uh, PhD from there in neurobiology has become as of 2019, the young investigator, got the young investigator award for the neuroscience society. First time a black has ever done that as an example. And then a uh, young woman getting a PhD in biochemistry from uh, Harvard, um, and, and going on to do a postdoc and now in the faculty at Columbia in School of Public Health. And so when you get that first, all of a sudden, and it's sad that we're still talking about first, but people begin to say it can be done. And they begin to bring in other people. We've got to get to the first and second and third and others. And I could name you dozens and dozens. Myhoff is now has hundreds, almost 400 who completed PhDs um, or in the, and others who are in the process or MD PhDs. Uh, the key, though, is that other campuses can do this. Finally, people often make the comment, well, it's because you've got a black president. No. Think about Penn State and Chapel Hill. No, the presidents are not of color. It takes commitment from people to make a difference. And before I get into questions, last point is this. We must find inspiration in many places. And so the inspiration for today, um, uh, in addition to the people I've already mentioned, would be um, Dr. Kismika Corbett. Some of you know that name. We're so proud of her. She's a Mao scholar, went to UMBC and then um, to Chapel Hill in her home state of North Carolina, came back to NIH postdoc, uh, and she was the co-leader of the team at NIH to produce that Moderna vaccine uh, and their technologies and some of the other vaccines, she along with Bonnie Graham. And so she becomes the first Black woman in the world to create a vaccine. Most of us have never even thought about, has there been one before? You know, and so that's the point about opening our minds and thinking about, dreaming about the possibilities. She goes on the faculty at Harvard in the fall. We need many more of these Kismikia Corbett's or Kafri Zarasa at Duke who's doing that. I mean, and we can do that if we become laser focused and if we're willing to look in the mirror and be honest about the challenges. Thank you very much. Ready for questions. Thank you so very much, Freeman. Uh, I'm, I, I wish that you could hear the applause, but I will applause, uh, I'll give some <laughs> applause uh, uh, myself to me, because um, very much appreciate, and very much appreciate your remarks and, and the, the audience that is here is, is, has, was, has been very attentive. I want to remind everyone in the audience that you should type questions into the Q&A box. I will be reading some of those questions as we go along. And I'm going to take, of course, the prerogative of being chair to ask uh, the first question, which is uh, maybe I shouldn't, but but after you've talked so much about moving the needle and how very important it is to move the needle, and 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 I'm asking myself as an audience member, how can I move the needle? And so I, I have a series of questions, and I interject them as I go along. But I'll start with me as the I, and that is I'm a professor. What can I do uh, to move the needle? There's several things, Rigoberto, and, and, and I know you are doing some great things at Hopkins right now. I've been reading about your work. Uh, let me Thank start you. by saying getting to know the issues, to understand the challenges that students of, colors, of color face. And that means um, finding, finding people who can come into your lab. I mean, I'm always interested in students getting into labs and having experiences, substantive experiences in research, number one. Number two, having conversations with your colleagues about the issues. One of our strategies in the Empowered University book is the use of analytics. Understand the data in your university, but particularly in your department. In other words, who are the people who are succeeding? Who've been the Blacks? Who've been the Hispanics? Who've been the whites and who've been the Asians? What have been their backgrounds? So using the technology to understand trends and patterns, number one, so that quantitative side, then the qualitative side, and then focus groups with students um, in chemistry, for example, to listen to their experiences, not just students of color. Because what I can tell you is most departments have never looked to see what is the probability of a, a young white male, a young white female who starts in chemistry, graduating with a degree in chemistry, and then what's the probability that they go on to get the PhD? Do we understand those, those pathways? 
And do we understand how many people leave and why do they leave? And so I'm often saying, if you show me a department or a university that deeply cares about students, then they're going to know those students and their circumstances. And if you show me one that cares about students, I'll show you one that also cares about students of color. So it shouldn't just be isolated, only students of color. We need to understand the larger numbers. Um, uh, I know that my, my grad alma mater, Illinois, has worked on that to some extent and is still working on it in terms of understanding the big picture of how students are doing in STEM. Thank you. Uh, Cindy Rivera Jimenez asks, what programs would you recommend for retention of students that want to do graduate studies but don't necessarily want to be, go to academia? Well, you know, I, I start just honestly starting with Meyerhoff because it's now had 30 years of experience. And some of our students have gone on the, on the faculties of fine institutions and different types of institutions, number one, but others have considered careers in science. Um, I wanna give credit to uh, one of my graduates, a PhD in computer science, Raf Simmel, who's over the applied physics lab at Hopkins. He has identified uh, Mauhaus as they have been going to grad school around the country and has pulled in a number of them in chemistry and other areas to work there at APL. So that the notion of, I would say, in terms of programs, you, I would go to the most successful campuses. Um, those, I mean, Texas El Paso uh, mainland, I would say, it has obviously done a really good job. They have, because they wouldn't have the money of the, 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 the larger places, and yet they are the largest producer when you get past the couple of Puerto Rico campuses, but I do for Latin, Latinx, but there's something that's wonderful about those University of Puerto Rico campuses. When you hear me saying those two campuses together, 900 over 10 years compared to the next four or five that don't get to 900, right? So looking at what they're doing, just as I'm very proud of what a place like Spelman has done uh, for HBCUs, right? Um, and very proud that University of Florida is one of those campuses, predominantly white, that is being able to produce more blacks and Latinos. So looking at those universities with the, the, the best track record will tell you something about programs that should be considered. And we're certainly proud of what UMBC has done and want to replicate that. So the, uh, the, the feeling is mutual. Wei asks, what can I contribute? So this is referring to Wei as a postdoc, presumably to move the needle. Yes, I think first of all, as a postdoc, the most important thing you can do is to research, research, research. You want to be the best scientist you can be. I know you're interested in helping, and to the extent that you get the chance to work with a grad student or an undergrad of color and to get them to pull them into the research. One of our challenges for postdocs and, and young faculty of color is that sometimes they're, they're pulled on, on to do so much in this area of diversity that their, their research slips. I am a strong believer. We want scientists of color to be as, as powerful in the research first as productive in that research. Because once you get tenure, then you can, you can do more and more. And it doesn't mean you wait until then, but I am saying to make sure you're balancing things in a way that the research comes first. The research comes first because then, whether you're going to a university or you're going to a lab somewhere, um, and that's not a university. Uh, and there are some who will decide to do other things. We have a number of PhDs who decided after that that they didn't want to. I do want to say this, often for the MD PhDs, what you see is that um, people pull them on both sides. And so the clinical people say, if you want to be a really good doctor, you've got to focus your attention here. And the serious scientist is going to say, no, you've got to focus on the science. And a young person who's not 30 years old sometimes is pulled. And invariably, they get pulled into the clinical uh, rather than the research. It's rare. That, um, I, I really, Sandy Williams, uh, former dean at, at Duke, who's back there now, was wonderful in working with my program, our program, and me and others. And they have four black males now on the faculty there. Uh, two already tenured, two on their ways, uh, MD, PhDs in three cases. And the key is that um, he helped those MD, PhDs, Kafri Zarasa, to balance the two and to they need protection. And so one of the points I want to make is it's not only that we need mentors, we need champions, advocates and champions who will knock down doors and say, wait a minute, let's be very careful about this. So to the postdoc, keep doing that research, help a student when you can, and just keep understanding the issues, but have that vision of becoming that very high, highly productive researcher who can pull many more people into the work. And I would argue that all of these um, outcomes are successes, right? You have okay. many, many pathways. 
Yeah. And we're not arguing that those are not successes. Yeah. The problem yeah. perhaps is that we lose, yeah. that is research enterprise, those of us in the research enterprise lose if we don't have these great minds stay in, and, 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 and expand what can be done in our profession, right? So you get to that. Yes. Yes, and I would say we, we need people who are going to all types of institutions. We know we need more in the research one institutions. We know the numbers are so small, but we need them in comprehensives, in two institutions, and people will follow different paths. But we also need them in corporations. You know, we've got a um, hundred biotech and IT companies on our campus, and we had to work really hard to identify Black and Latinx PhDs who can do that work, who can be involved in companies. If you look at the Baltimore, Washington corner and you go to most biotech companies, you see very few Blacks and very few people of color, Latinx people. Sim similarly, in the national agencies, when I chaired this commission for o Mr. Obama on educational excellence for African-Americans, we got all the data on the national agencies. Not one agency at that time could say we had even 1% of the scientists who were Black. And it was very small percentages of Hispanics. Today, we're up to still not 2%. So in all the national infrastructure agencies, we still have very small percentages of Blacks and Latinx, of Hispanic people who are scientists. Perhaps you can, perhaps you can comment on the other factors that that kind of representation would have in our one institution. So as we have a more diverse set of faculty and administrators and staff in, in, in our institutions, how will that, what will be the the additional effects on our society that oh, would come great, from that. Great question, great question. Um, and I, I'm always saying this because if it, right now, um, since George Floyd, who seems to be a symbol for the, the structural racism, um, is a symbol, not seems to be, but, but since that time, every institution, even companies are doing more with DEI. But DEI is about much more than a title. It's fine to have, uh, uh, and we really are very proud of our Equity and Inclusion Council, but to have faculty on that council can make a big difference, number one. Number two, um, we need, I mean, the, the strength of the academic program is going to be with the faculty. We need support from a president and dean, but it's really with the faculty. And what I'm saying is that we need to be supporting your chief diversity officers, but, but th their role is, will not be important if you don't have people in real power in the professoriate who are also working in that work. DEI people can be facilitators and that's wonderful, but the work has to be done by professors. And when you, as soon as you get one or two, all of a sudden you've got more people wanting to come to that work. People begin to believe it's possible. I'm telling you with, with Dr. Corbett now, with the publicity she's getting, all these little girls and all these young black women are writing to her all the time. I wanna do that. I want to be an immunology. I want to. I want to create a vaccine. You you begin to believe it's possible. And even though, uh, and I would also say in departments, when there's no one of color in the department, that perspective is not there. If and and so if the same thing was true with women. One of our recommendations in the 2011 report was that we have an advanced type program for people of color. We're still waiting to see that kind of program. I I was the PI on the advanced program at UMBC with a number of women co-eyes, and we know it made a difference in the number of women faculty in departments. When there are not women in the department, men have one perspective. And even when they are working to be as supportive of everyone, they don't really get it the way they can when women are there. The same thing is true when there are people of color. So when the people of color are in the room, the conversation changes. That's true in corporate America. It's true in the academy. It's true throughout our society. Uh, thank you. Switching the, to one of the questions from the, uh, from the uh, attendees, Regina Easley asks, what factor does education affordability have in student recruitment and retention? UPR is substantially more affordable than some of the HBCUs in the top 10 list. Right. The affordability is an important issue. One of the, and, and if a student does not have the funds to go, um, it's very difficult to get in. But even if the student gets enough and then starts working, <clears throat> the, the line I use is this. It's impossible to major in biochemistry and do well while working 25 hours on the outside. It's almost impossible. And one of our challenges at the national level is that people don't recognize we, sh we should be giving much more money for financial support for the students at the undergraduate level. Yes, we need it at the grad level. People get that. But somehow people think that undergrads will be okay. They are not okay. You know, and I mean, for us with Myhoff, yeah, we've gotten money from Mr. Myhoff 
But it, it, the money we get from our endowment, and we are working to build endowment for institutional stability, but the money we get from the endowment gives us about 30% of what we need every year. And so every year we're out begging for money constantly. You know? And so the, the fact is that we need public and private resources leveraged to produce more people. The person, the, the, the questioner is absolutely right. Without resources, it's really hard to make a difference. Uh, maybe this uh, leads us right to Ryan Dover's question, which is, what is the estimated cost for a university to implement a program like UMBC, like the one that UMBC has? Sure. I know there are some grants that are now being made available by some national institutes, and UMBC has or had a grant from the Meyerhoff family, which you just referred to. Yes. An article I read stated around $8 million to start the programs at UNC and Penn State. Secondly, what arguments would you take to an administration if we can't secure the funding from outside sources, or we don't want to wait for that to happen? It's a great question. We started Meyerhoff with um, a $500,000 grant 30 years ago with Mr. Meyerhoff. And um, we brought in, at that time, 19 students. Uh, and uh, right now, we have to put it in perspective, right now, the program costs us about $3 million per year. We have, we have been able to build and to get commitment from the university that people gave money years ago from their budgets for this idea of diversity. The university has to put some skin into the game. And so we were able to get together almost a million dollars. So of the three million, a million is in the base from the university. Uh, another almost a million will come from um, the, the endowment that we have. Uh, and then we have to raise over a million a year to keep, and that's for 300 students. And that's not paying full rides. In the early years, we were giving them full rides. Now, a lot of kids want mile hop. We have thousands trying to get into mile hop. We only take um, about 60 to 70 per year, okay? But large numbers who want to be in the program. And if we had more funding, we could double the numbers. This is what I keep saying to people. The, but, but the key is this, in the early years, you don't have to start off with a program with 300 students. I mean, you can start building community. You can start with 10 students, 10 per year, you see. And, uh, and quite frankly, every institution gives out different kinds of scholarships and financial support. You can decide to focus some of the money you have on uh, strength in chemistry or strength in science or majors in these disciplines. And what happens is you build the brand and it does make a difference. Um, it's still, and then we've been able to get grant money um, uh, from um, a, a number of places, uh, Rod Pettigrew for years at NIBIB was giving us quite a bit of money. We're still working to get some more from them now that he's left, for example, at NIH, but also Nora Vokal has been amazing in National Institute of Drug and, 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 uh, um, and, and Addiction, uh, has been giving us funds. Uh, and then, of course, we have the URISE program, which is one of those that gives us money. And we have a BUILD program, and that gives money. Now, but only a small portion of it can be used some portion can be used for scholarships, others for other kinds of things. So it's resources. But I would say this, this issue of representation should be a national priority in the same way that finding vaccine, the vaccine for COVID was. I mean, we've got to get to that level. The question in moving the needle is how urgent is this matter? And for me, what we say in some of our articles is, why is it that so many people don't believe in science or evidence. Well, they don't see people looking like themselves or people who are from their backgrounds, whether they're first generation college kids who, I mean, families, two thirds of America's families have never had anyone go to college, just uh, graduate from college. I mean, think about that. I mean, it's, it's uh, only about 20 some percent of African-Americans, only 15% of Hispanics, but only about 38% of whites, you know, and, and maybe 50% of Asians, but you put it together, two thirds of Americans have never had anyone graduate from college. If you've never seen anyone in your family who is either a doctor or a scientist, why would you believe in science and medicine? So it is a matter of national public health and security that we have many more. So it's gotta be that level of urgency. And I would say to campuses where we're working to get that national sense of urgency, I do think that there are money, there are funds on any campus being used right now to bring in students. The question is, how important is success in science on your campus? There's the issue you have to face. And, and that's not to take away from the importance of arts humanities and social sciences, but the place where we are the least 
uh, successful in our country would be natural sciences and engineering. We need to do much more. We need many more. My campus, for example, has to do more to produce more Blacks in the social sciences, PhDs, because all my African-Americans in the social sciences go to law school right now. You know, and we're saying we want to direct some in the other direction. So every campus has its issues, but I'm suggesting in natural sciences and engineering, there has to be a priority for the campus to make it happen. Those law students are also success stories, but again, we they are lose. successful. They and are successful. And I want to also give you, and I want to give you points for the shout outs to the uh, various funders, because it's a good reminder that uh, this is about people and about how all of us have to be intentional to move the needle. And it, yeah. it's at every level, including f foundation agencies. Um, Jesse Robbins asked, and this is again, this is the last question about money, but, but I think it's an important one. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations for small liberal arts colleges who do not have the funds to replicate these programs from research universities? You know, I, I, I would say if you talk with the staff members at um, a number of places, including uh, NIH and NSF in their education divisions, there are programs that have been successful on liberal arts colleges that can be helpful. Some of the HBCUs that I mentioned uh, have had funding from those agencies, but other institutions have also. Uh, and there are campuses that are very successful. Liberal arts colleges, quite frankly, I would say best type for producing scientists. I mean, people from Harold Vomas to Tom Check are graduates of liberal arts colleges. And what I've said when I've worked with a number of liberal arts colleges um, is that the question is how to take some of the funding, broad funding that you're using for diversity to produce more people of color in those areas. Because liberal arts colleges produce a number, disproportionately large numbers of PhDs in science, but they're simply not people of color. And while I, I agree that being a lawyer is successful, if the student has an interest though in science, I think it's so sad when the student doesn't get the support to continue in science. If the student comes to kind of saying, I want to be an attorney, I want to be the Supreme Court justice, then that's success. But, but I mean, clearly when the student has an interest in science and on the liberal arts colleges we see, and I've been to a lot, you'll see numbers of students of all races who are not succeeding. And so it's about priority of the institution. But I do think talking to people in successful programs about places they get bigger and larger amounts of money can be helpful. The other uh, aspect of this is pointed out by Marilyn Huff. She asked, she, know, she knows, at the HBCUs and PR universities, there's a critical mass of STEM students of color to support each other through the difficult times. And this, mm -hmm. by the way, uh, this goes to this cohort building that you were mentioning that's a key to the Meyerhoff program. Yeah. She says universities with smaller POC communities tend to have support groups for POC across disciplines. Unfortunately, this can lead to POC students having stronger support networks outside the STEM fields that incite it. How yeah. can this be addressed? It's a great question. I've looked at the POSSE program for years, know the founder of the program, and, and uh, I know there's at least one science program uh, that's a part of POSSE. But what I would say is that it's really important to um, identify students early in the freshman year or some from high school who could be a part of a group. A group may be five students, and there may be uh, a program across disciplines, but you can still bring together those students who have an interest in science. I've seen this done, and they may be from physics to chemistry to other areas, and to give them some special experiences together. And for smaller campuses, the idea of having five working together can make a big difference. Um, uh, you'd be surprised how three to five students who have a common mission and whose mission, by the way, is, as the social scientists would say, would be strengths-based. In other words, too often we talk about people of color and their deficiencies, as opposed to talking about what strengths they bring to the table. And, and, and for our campus, there's a wide range in Mauhaus. There are those who have come from really first-rate science and tech schools in the richest counties in my state and all the way up to New York, from Howard County, Montgomery County, and they are quite good, they're quite good. But this is the point we don't realize. Even when students are quite good and have fours and fives and near perfect math SATs, most of them don't make it either. That's what we don't realize. I mean, because people say, oh, he gets good students. Yeah, but we've done studies to look at students who had very high test scores, who've gone to some of the best places and they leave science. At best, they may stay in medicine, not majoring in science, taking the science courses they need. And, and that's fine too, because we need more doctors. 
But if they started off thinking about a research career, that's when I say we have a challenge. But I, I do think starting small and having conversations with three students even and seeing how they're doing and taking the time to look at the last 10 or 15 over years who have succeeded or not and talking to them can make a big difference. And then getting some faculty who are interested in these issues. But I would say to every campus, the question I would ask, for me, the ineluctable question, is: have you looked at the data by race, by gender, by first generation college or not to determine the probability of a student graduating in chemistry who starts in chemistry? Even when the base is small, what can we find out? What can we learn? Get the data first, start there, and then listen to the voices of people who tried it and left it. I'll give you just one out of the box strategy we used in early years. When students earn C's in the first year, the first year we had only black males, by the way, which some people didn't like. Black women were very pleased we were trying to help black males because all we could hear about were prisons. And we started that way because Mr. Myhoff, who's an engineer, said everything he saw in black males was negative. This was 30 years ago. Um, and we started the first year with black males. Second year, we got some money from NASA. We were delighted to bring in black women. Uh, and then we moved on from that. And now Myhoff, by the way, is maybe 70% of color, 30% whites and, and, and Asians who are interested in the issue of underrepresentation. But in that first group, uh, several of the students earned C's in chemistry, in the first chemistry. And they had been A students from their high schools. And we decided together that they would retake the course. There were a lot of tears, uh, not, a, not a positive situation, but retaking the course made all the difference in the world. The question you have to ask, and we did the analytics later on, if a student earns C's in the first year of science, what's the probability that the student goes ahead and does even better the next year? It's rare, it's very rare. You don't get in math, in, in, in chemistry, in physics, if you don't, because everything is sequentially based. I'm studying French right now. You don't start from scratch and all of a sudden begin speaking fluently. You, you learn their basics there in conjugation and vocabulary and you build. The same thing as you know is true in science. And so, I mean, I ask you to look at those students who are on C's and whether they succeeded or not. Often they do not. Now, finally, the, the faculty at UMBC and the chair of the Department of Chemistry decided, that's when they decided to go to the Chemistry Discovery Center to see how we could increase the number of people earning Bs are better. Because we realized that the greatest chance of success will be when students can get at least Bs in courses and get involved in research. And that, that has made the difference. It's one strategy. I would, I, I would argue that what you were doing was fixing the program, not fixing the students. You yeah. identified that those students were not learning the material in the way that you were exposing them to. And you had to change the program yeah, to yeah. be able to have them succeed. Yeah, and then yeah. they did. Yeah. Surprising. Yeah. And you know what? And one of the things we say in the book, because it's not all good, some, you know, it's important in a book to tell the problems too. We were having incredible success. We brought in some new faculty who had been taught in the old way, who to believe most people shouldn't get an A or B. And when we looked at the data, we had started going back the other way. All for all students. But we started having larger percentages. So we had to really rethink it and retalk. I mean, so even though we had talked about the success, because the mindset of so many is, well, you're not gonna have a sort of people getting A's and B's. It's not about having a standard set by the American Chemical Society of a, of a test that everybody would agree, here are the concepts you must have mastered, but rather we shouldn't have more than 30% of the students getting A's or B's, regardless of how good they are. So I'm saying, even when you make, such a, make progress, if you don't keep watching it, it goes right back to the old way. Yeah, that's right. So Edgar Ari Ariaga asks, besides completion of degree rates, what else could programs use to assess how they are moving the needle, in particular in the short term? Sure, uh, I would say just starting with great grades and attitudes of students and level of involvement in research. Uh, looking at the grades of the students, I mean, I mean, people sometimes don't use the rigor of analysis. They can say, here's a nice kid who keeps doing research, and, and that's great. But you, you think about it, you're going to need, I'm using that, I'm saying it kind of hard nose, but you need about that B average, you really do, uh, to make sure the student has grasped the concepts necessary to go to the next level. But secondly, uh, they need research experiences that will really increase the passion for the work. Because what you're going to be telling them is, this is going to take you anywhere from seven or eight years to nine or 10, depending on the situation, depending on the situation, when you think about the PhD and postdoc. And so if you think about it, the only way people are gonna do that is if they're really excited. And then the other part, of course, and I've been on the study groups looking at careers after the PhD, we know all the reasons that a student would decide not to do it and how long it is before they can get the first R01 and all of that. So you got all that to counter, but I would say in those early years, um, it's having them feeling good about 
grasping the concepts, and secondly, using what they have learned in research labs and, and, and learning the, the joy, the fascination of failing in a lab, quite frankly, because it's not always that you succeed. Sometimes you learn more when you fail, but you understand you get back up and you keep going. Learning that, that, that the thing that Mike Summers always said to me is, Freeman, more than having a kid get an A, I want her to be intellectually curious constantly asking questions, right? And it's developing that, that muscle of asking the questions and getting back up when you don't do well. It's all of that, that mindset that goes into researchers producing researchers. Those would be the things. And so looking at their performance, are they publishing papers? They, uh, the sweet spot of UMBC is large numbers of our students publishing referee journals as undergraduates, in some cases as first authors. And so we really are immersed in that. And then we have others who work at the Maryland Medical School, some who work over at Hopkins, and then many who work in the national agencies. And it makes, and then they go away in the summers, but we always talk about sustained research experiences first, over a couple of years in the same lab, just to get that experience, all right? So it's Absolutely. all those kinds of things. The quality of the research experiences, quality of their attitudes, and listening to them, are they really feeling that they are welcomed in the program? Just, just one example, there was a, an honors organic chemistry class and the professor came in, he looked at the class and he said, and it turned out the class for the first time had at least half students of color. And the first thing uh, he said was, um, this doesn't look like an organic chemistry honors class. And so several of the students of color came to me very upset and said, a couple of the women, they said, you know, he's not used to seeing us in the class and he's already made certain assumptions. And I said, no, go back to him. And ask him, you're a scientist. Don't draw conclusions from your anecdotal impression. Go back and ask him what he meant. Just ask. I said, don't be angry, you know, but take your time, breathe deeply. Don't all of you go together, but just a couple and just say, what, you know, what does it mean? And innocently, he said, I've never, ha I've never had an, an honest organic chemistry class this large. This is more people <laughs> than I've ever seen in the organic chemistry class, right? It was a wonderful story. But if he had not, if, we, if, if I hadn't told him to go and ask, they would have assumed it was racism or sexism, you see? And what I'm saying is often there are misinterpretations, misunderstandings. In other cases, it could be the student, the person says something that can be a little insulting. But having those robust conversations to make sure students of color aren't feeling people are against them somehow can make a big difference. We, we need trust. We need trust yeah. to allow ourselves to benefit from our differences. Right? Yes. yes. And, and that's, that's exactly what that story points out. So I, I thank you for sharing. Yes. Uh, to, to, speaking of differences, the diversity, Satna Sarupia, Sarupria asks, can you please define who do you mean when you speak of scientists of color? Are these limited to Hispanic and Black scientists? No, no, no. Many of my, uh, and we have different definitions. We have First of all, we have very few scientists of color at UMBC. Let me start there. Uh, even when we've had, uh, let me just put it out there. Even when we've been able to attract, for example, we have a couple of Latinx faculty in, 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 in biology and chemistry. Uh, but uh, when, we've, when we've attracted Blacks in chemistry, unfortunately, did not work out. Did not work out in terms of the research. All right. Um, we have, uh, we do not have any Blacks in chemical engineering. And so we, so the scientists and the engineers who are helping in many cases are whites, quite frankly. And that's why the Maha program also has whites in it and Asians in it, because we need people of all races who are interested in these areas. The, the, the scientific infrastructure is heavily white and then some Asians with a few Blacks and Latinx. We cannot do it alone. It needs all types of people to be able to do it, for sure. Uh, in this context, and I think we, we recognize that we're celebrating AAPI month, um, Linda Nan asks, what actions are high, higher education programs taking to address the model minority effects, such as a stereotype that is detrimental to the advancement of, which is a stereotype uh, that is detrimental to the advancement of Southeast Asian Americans in STEM? We have to talk about the issues. You know, we have had wonderful students who are Pacific Islanders. And we bring it in the mild program and in general, and we bring them into the conversation to understand that it's, it, it, first of all, when thinking broadly, beyond science, when thinking about diversity, it's very important to bring specificity to the area. Uh, the, the report that we did 
uh, talked some about Native Americans and Asians, but it was heavily Blacks and Latinos because those are the biggest groups of underrepresented groups. But we still need to talk about Pacific Islanders, for example. Uh, we also need to talk about those Native Americans. Um, uh, I'll never forget Carlos Gutierrez at NIH and his bringing that to everybody's attention, for example. But I would also say uh, um, uh, the, the notion of um, specificity and understanding what those groups are experiencing on the campus, very important. So one of the things, just in terms of the culture of the university, we do have a range of diversity groups uh, 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 and different groups within the Asian population or Asian American population. So a um, wonderful group of, of Filipino kids and then others who are focused on the Pacific Islands uh, specifically. And most important to talk about what challenges they face each group. One of the points that, uh, that I've heard from students often is don't just assume that all Asian people are well-educated. Yeah, it's true that 55% of Americans who are from Asian backgrounds have a bachelor's degree, but there are some populations, Pacific Islanders and other, where that, those numbers are as low as they are for Blacks and Hispanics. And so that idea of Pacific Island, the idea of specificity is very important. Thank you. Uh, JJ Fuentes Rivera asks, as you said earlier, it takes researchers to produce researchers. It is often an uphill battle to balance and manage the very busy research academic calendar of a tenure track position, especially if you are from, under, un, from an underrepresented background. His yeah. question is, or their question, forgive me, their question is, what can departments do or what are they currently doing with pre-tenure underrepresented professors to foster recruitment and retention initiatives of URM graduate students? There are two things I would say. Number one, you heard me mention the NSF program. The NSF uh, Advanced Program for Women has been quite successful on my campus and on many campuses right now. And that program provides a lot of money to build infrastructure in order to support women, as we should be, because we still have major shortages in a number of the departments. And that's why specificity, even within natural sciences and engineering, will be important, um, because some areas are better doing better than others. But, but um, it seems to me part of, of startup packages for our underrepresented groups will involve opportunities to support them in bringing in students who can be successful. And I would say two things to an underrepresented person who is uh, working towards tenure. You certainly want to attract people of color when you can find them at the level that you can really work with them and they can help you out and you can help them out. There will be some cases where it may not be possible at first, because a part of the problem is what's the reputation of the department right now in succeeding in science? I mean, it's taken us a long time to, even after having great success at the undergraduate level, to begin to have some success with our PhD programs uh, in seeing how students could succeed, whether in computer science or in chemistry or what other areas, and then where they go when they do succeed. I mean, Mike Summers can now show you uh, Black and Latinx students uh, and students of color who've gone on faculties of many of the R01 campuses and some other faculty too. So when we talk about recruiting, you can say, look at these students. They've completed their PhDs from us, postdocs here, and this is where they are now. That makes all, so you've got to build that reputation. The question is, is there enough of a reputation that it, it, it's possible to do it, or is it going to be an uphill battle? Let me just be honest with you. If it's going to be such an uphill battle, you're not getting people of the level you need. Your number one priority as a young faculty member is to get somebody who can be really good in your lab. Really good in your lab. So, you will have time to bring in more underrepresented groups. So, Freeman, we're entering the lightning round. Um, I'm going to ask you a quick question or two, and you're going to have one sentence. Yeah, okay. Uh, mentoring works. Mentoring is one on one. How do we do it at scale? We need to do what we did with the NSF advanced program that is, training sessions on mentoring for a lot of people and looking at the return on investment. One thing. There's one thing that everybody that's listening in the audience should do. What they could, they, what should they do to move the needle? One sentence. Every person should look in the mirror and say, "What am I doing right now? And what can I ask my university to do to make a difference?" Take responsibility. Not to expect the president to do it all for you, right? That's right. That's <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you, President Hrabowski, for these wonderful remarks. This has been a great conversation. Um, I, I, I was only able to do it because I was armed with all these wonderful questions from the participants, and I'm looking forward to seeing them engaging with these questions through the uh, Slack channel. Uh, there's some questions that are still open. We'll, make, we'll I'm not sure how we'll be able to answer those, but we'll sh shift them over to the Slack channel. And some of us, maybe uh, Professor 
President Hrabowski uh, will answer them as well. Uh, and, and, uh, and we're now gonna take a 20 minute break uh, and we'll ask you to return, everyone to return at 1220 and we'll start with the next session. Thank you again, President Hrabowski. Big clap. Thank you very much.